Okay, I think we're going to uh, kick off in a moment Deluxe. here. Deluxe, yeah. What company are you with? Any clip. Any clip. What's any clip do? I'm not, uh, and if anyone out there has seen Steve Ehrlich, uh, let let us know. Uh, but otherwise, I think we won't wait for him, and we'll just uh, get started. What's that? Not really. Come on in, have a seat. You always well prepared in the notes. I remember that. Because you're a marketing person, so you good stuff. All right, so let's kick off. Is it if it's too noisy back there? If someone could shut the door, uh, that would be great. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Excellent. All right, we are here to talk about video everywhere, technologies and platforms enabling the next generation of over-the-top TV. Uh, now, I don't want you to worry because it says technology and platforms. This isn't a a technology-focused panel. Uh, we're going to be talking about things like consumer behavior, uh, disruptions to the value chain, new business models, uh, platforms as a as an enablement for that, and and what the opportunities and challenges are. Uh, and we're going to start by um, going down the panelists that are here. And uh, if you could each introduce yourself and your company and uh, how you fit into the value chain, that would be great. Uh, Peter, you want to start us off? Sure. Uh, my name is Peter Ward, and I'm coming from uh, Verizon Digital Media Services. Uh, Verizon Digital Media Services is a few years old uh, division within the innovation group uh, within Verizon, uh, and the vision is really to uh, enable the next generation ecosystem for uh, television to really support what I think uh, all our kids want, which is any content, any device, anytime, anywhere. Uh, and that type of experience is just not supported by the satellite ecosystem uh, that's that's been uh, uh, you know in existence the last 40 or so years. So um, we're an end-to-end -end system uh, that uh, uh, takes the content right from the the distributor all the way to uh, the consumer device. And uh, my role within that has kind of been a business planning role uh, and strategy, so. Great. Uh, I'm Dave Cornella, I'm with Deluxe Digital Distribution. If you're familiar with Deluxe, Deluxe is a large company, lots of divisions. Our, our division's about three years old, and the focus for Deluxe Digital Distribution is to really simplify the whole workflow for how do you manage content, whether you're a service provider or an OTT service. Uh, if you start looking at the requirements in that market today to manage how you're going to provide the, that content to all the different devices in the market, uh, all the work involved as you get into multiple language packs, if you're going internationally and abroad and, and you want to simplify your footprint on your CDN storage, all those headaches that any service provider or OTT uh, provider is going to have, we take off. So uh, we, we use the word end-to-end -end as well, but everyone uses a different, form, a different uh, means. Ours is end-to-end. -end content workflow from managing the receipt of those assets from any content provider all the way through anything required to actually streaming that to the device. Great. And, and my role over there is uh, SVP of business development for the team. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I'm Sudhir Kaushik. I'm with Uyala. I'm not sure uh, how many of you are familiar with the company. Uh, I run product management for Uyala. We are based in the Bay Area. Uh, the company is about seven years old now, founded by uh, folks who left Google uh, at the time when uh, YouTube was sort of gaining uh, popularity. And, and what we do is we provide an end-to-end -end platform for media companies, broadcasters, and operators to really create engaging video experiences around their content. So we do, again, I'm going to use end-to-end -end again uh, in, a di in a different context. This is... Uh, all the way from the content ingestion to the asset management uh, or to the playback experiences uh, on the different devices uh, that we support. Uh, but our core value proposition and our core sauce, uh, given sort of the Google DNA, has always been around uh, analytics. So it's been around providing real-time insights into content, audience, and advertising, and uh, partnering uh, with uh, all the uh, top ad networks out there uh, but, you know, uh, yesterday we acquired uh, an ad platform, uh, Video Plaza, in, in Europe. So pretty soon we will sort of uh, 
be serving our own ads uh, through our own ad server, but that's really what we do. Uh, today we power uh, up to a few billion streams daily, reaching about 250 million uniques. Uh, so if you go to ESPN.com and watch any video that's been delivered through Yala, uh, other customers that we have are Univision, DirecTV, uh, Foxtel, Telstra, uh, to name a few. So you work with the Aussies? Uh, that's right. I'm, my <laughs> accent is not quite there yet, but yeah. it's going to get there. Uh, we'll, we'll, work, we'll work on All it right. later. Um, Ilo, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Gavin Goodvec. I'm head of content at AnyClip Media. Uh, AnyClip Media is a large digital distribution network. Uh, we're based in uh, Jerusalem, Israel, with offices in uh, New York, London, and Los Angeles. Um, we started about six years ago with the idea of uh, being able to search for any moment inside a feature film or any other kind of premium content and uh, share those moments with your friends. So what the company did traditionally was uh, we signed deals with uh, major, major Hollywood studios, uh, Universal and Warner Brothers, just to name a couple. And we developed a system, for, a system for extracting metadata. And so we have a very advanced system for extracting metadata, understanding what's going on in any moment of any movie or, or TV program or any, any content, frankly. And um, what we did uh, a couple of years ago is we decided, as opposed to just having a consumer-facing website, we were going to distribute that content online, so we developed our own proprietary player with, which has intelligence in it, and now those players are seen each month on about 200,000 websites um, all over the world to about 75 million unique users, and we are able to match the context of the website with the clips from the premium content that we show. We monetize that through um, in-stream advertising, and uh, that's what we do. Excellent. And John? Uh, good afternoon. I'm John Petricelli. I'm CEO of Bulldog Digital Media. We facilitate and optimize premium live content experiences across all connected device platforms, which is somewhat of a longer way of saying we bring the Red Bull Stratus effect to these premium digital experiences, which we do through best practices my team and I have cultivated and curated over the last eight years in this market segment. So I ran a live streaming technology company that I sold into AEG who's the world's largest presenter of live music and live sports at the end of 2009. And we powered almost every uh, experience, premium experience in the live streaming market you could think of. The Grammys, the Oscars, Masters, the E3, uh, TED, uh, TED Conference, as well as all of MTV's live experiences that fed into their broadcast. Prior to being acquired and through that acquisition, I had socialized this concept to YouTube of delivering big premium experiences to draw big audiences to the YouTube platform, but to also expose that audience base to those assets. And as that business grew, you know, we, we started to see trends in massive consumption on mobile platforms, but also you know, off the chart you, you know, viewer duration times for things like concerts and music festivals. So a group of us spun out about two years ago to form this company to work with all the stakeholders in that ecosystem, brands, agencies, content owners, uh, distribution platforms, and also, we specialize in uh, music festivals, multi-day experiences like Red Bull just powered uh, with Lollapalooza and Austin City Limits. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. And um, I'm Jonathan Hurd, a director with Altman Vlandry & Company. We're a 100-person firm with offices, strategy consulting firm, with offices in Boston, New York, and San Francisco. And we're uh, focused on communications and media. So this um, panel is apparently being live webcast. So if you're watching, thank you for joining. And um, there isn't a facility for people who are watching to um, lob in questions. But I'm going to try an experiment. I'm going to give my email address. And we'll see if anyone emails with questions. Uh, J-H-U-R-D, J-H-U-R-D, at altville, A-L-T-V-I-L dot com. So if you're watching, We'll see if anyone emails any uh, questions in. All right, so let's start with the uh, consumer experience and speaking about video everywhere. You know, you mentioned, uh, Peter, at the very beginning, the reality of what uh, viewers today want, you know, video, when I want it, where I want it, et cetera. What are the barriers today to uh, that perfect consumer experience uh, of watching video everywhere on your own terms. And, you know, so what are the major things that aren't fulfilling that, uh, that ideal scenario today? Um, I think it, most of it is a rights 
a problem, a business problem rather than a technology problem. Uh, but I think we're starting to see just from, we, I think we've all done this, or many of us on have done this panel now multiple times, uh, <laughs> as in, you know, like six or eight times. And uh, I think we always So say, you know my questions. Yeah. So I think we, we, a lot of times we say, so what's changed in the last six months or what's changed in the last year? And I think this actual, this past six months from the business, uh, from the rights perspective, uh, probably had the most, uh, you know, positive movement uh, within my recent memory, uh, just in that we, we've we seen uh, some, you know, kind of some precedents now set with uh, DISH uh, in, in the rights that uh, they have now with, uh, with Disney and then also uh, the Viacom rights um, that have been given to Sony. And we're seeing things that I can't talk about that obviously get uh, um, our CEO and chairman have talked about uh, in vague terms about what we're planning to launch next year in terms of a mobile only uh, virtual MVPD. Um, but there is, uh, I think, you know, it, it's coming and we're the, those kind of uh favored nations deals that have been in effect uh and have been kind of hard to break now we're getting those uh molds break broken and i think that's the first step towards getting to um what people want uh in terms of uh uh something that is in uh, the, the current paradigm which is you know it's stuck on my set top box it's 500 channels it's only available on a program grid or on a dvr that sits you know on three set top boxes that i have to rent for 10 bucks a piece uh which is not generally what uh you know what we want and what our children you know how at least my three kids don't really know how to use a set top box and you kind of joke that that's that it's as foreign to them as you know, the rabbit ears and the remote from the 60s, you know, was to us, at least me, the, you know, of way too many channels, uh, uh, you know, on a set top box from your cable company. So I think there's change of foot, uh, but still business rights issues are the are the biggest challenge, uh, more so than I think the technological challenges. So that's my perspective. I think that I agree with that. <laughs> I think the technology challenge is really a money challenge. It's just, you can, it's all solvable. Um, you look at what's happening and you look at some of the trends and uh, the types of content that's going to be coming out with 4K and even Dolby Vision and other things of that nature that people are going to want when they see it. Uh, those end up being just challenges of the cost of getting that content to the device. So it's all solvable, but I, you know, I think one of the key things, not to put a plug in for Deluxe, is one of the things we do is by having a, a large cloud platform where we end up managing and end for that customer, we have the capability that when when they decide, hey, Apple's going to entertain putting our app on their device, I got to I got to use FairPlay. I need an HL variant. We can actually take because if we're managing all their their content and we have we're doing four million minutes of a week right now of content reprocessing, we can actually take their entire library and move that to those variants within a couple of weeks. So the, one of the things is, if you're in the market today, you don't know what's going to be hot next month, where your opportunities will be on devices and platforms. And you need to make sure you're flexible because it's always easy to look at your requirements today, budget it, and then find out that it's somewhat obsolete in six months. So I think, I think there are challenges on the technology side. It's a money issue and it's all solvable, but you want to make sure that you approach it with more of a service model than building up capital <coughs> infrastructure that you, know, you may need to continually pour money into. So. so what about from a consumer perspective, though, with all of the different providers? You are obviously have many different customers. There are many different platforms there, this fragmentation that, that exists. Um, Who's going to bring that all together? And, and in fact, is that or is that a problem for uh, consumers? And are millennials just used to a, a fragmented world? Uh, I can speak to that. You know, um, in 2012, we were doing some live experiences for Coca-Cola on the YouTube platform, and there were two. Uh, there was one significant study by Intel, and then a, a, almost a press release by the CEO. Intel said that as a society, we had 3 billion connected devices in 2012, projected to grow to 50 billion by 2020, with most of that growth starting and occurring from 2015 on. In parallel, we saw an announcement from the CFO of Coca-Cola saying, I'm going to pull away from traditional 30-second VOD ads on TV because of the DVR problem that we're having. We're going to put our money into live. So you'll see us on 
American Idol and the World Cup and the Olympics, we're also going to move more into digital. And those were two pretty significant develop, developments. And also you have the now the biggest section of our society is happens to be 23 years old and they simply don't consume contents through traditional means. Um, and they also seem to have multiple connected devices at, at their disposal or in their home or that they own. So it's going to be challenging to solve that fragmentation, but the, the ability to render that content and push it out and deliver it to those connected devices and also tie in uh, social networking and, and those types of, of services that enhance and optimize the experience can also be ways to reach those consumers uh, for reach, but also have a, a brand come along and support that and advertise through that medium. Yeah, and I think um, Facebook, obviously, Facebook's going to play a huge part in this. Um, Facebook just launched Atlas recently, which is their uh, platform, which actually they, they're actually going to be able to follow the consumer, even do off on their offline purchases and things like that. So I think Facebook is going to be a center of bringing the content together, a place where people will be able to see the content. And I think that, um, you know, content is, uh, I read an article saying that content is today's water cooler event, right? And if it's, if content's today's water cooler event, then I think that, you know, social and Facebook is actually the virtual water cooler, right? And so the fact that today um, shows will be able to be, um, Succeed, will succeed or fail very, very quickly depending on social input is a, big, is a big deal. And I actually, if I can just digress one minute, I think from a point of view of consuming news as well, um, I think that this additional social element, um, you know, makes news go viral very, very quickly. And in fact, it can cause, you know, big swings in even, even you know, geopolitics. And I think so all of this so around social and, you know, getting back to being around Facebook, I think this is a very, very important change in the way um, people are finding content, consuming content, and then, you know, interacting with it. Okay, well, let me, uh, so talking about these barriers for consumers, I, summarizing a couple of points. One is content rights. And um, I, I guess I would say the confusion of where can I find something, you know, on what service, in what time frame is it going to be available? Am I going to be able to see the latest episode or whatever? That's kind of a big mm -hmm. mystery to consumers. The second thing is with all this content out there, uh, discovering it and having some point of aggregation. And Gavin, you're saying Facebook, you think, will be a major player there in terms of uh, providing that aggregation and discovery of content. Uh, yeah, I just heard a panel, consumers. like in the, ne uh, in the room next door, where, where the gentleman said up to 80% of, um, of plays of premium content from major brands come through the Facebook interface. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. That's going to be a major deal. Hmm. I just heard that now, and I was like, that's something. Well, how do, um, all right, so solving these challenges, and, and there, are, there are other, I think, for uh, consumers, even though the technology is supposedly solved, uh, I would say from my personal uh, video viewing on non-television devices and sometimes even televisions, uh, that it, it, there are many still technology glitches, issues, you know, ads that uh, are too repetitive from, you know, that mm -hmm. as well as just buffering, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. But, you know, with all with, with all of those challenges, what are the, the major opportunities that still need to be addressed with with the uh, video platforms today? And, you know, and what what barrier? How can you uh, overcome some of these challenges for consumers? So, um, you know, I I think just piggybacking on what Peter was saying around uh, rights, uh, a huge focus or rather reason for the lack of adoption has been how do you sort of even the playing field for the content owner, the advertiser, and the consumer, right? You have different players in the ecosystem focusing on maybe one or maybe two uh, parts of that puzzle, right? And unfortunately, that doesn't create an even playing field. Uh, so there are a number of things happening uh, that are actually accelerating or making that uh, playing field a lot more even. So whether it's 
um, at ease of technology, so the ease of deployment to multiple platforms. That's sort of um, uh, reducing the time required to get as many devices live um, uh, possible, more so than it was four or five years ago. Uh, there are other sort of developments around Nielsen ratings for mobile or Comscore ratings for mobile, which means that content owners now feel that they are getting attribution for some of the traffic. So we have customers where we have their 40, 50% of the traffic on mobile devices, which really was not used when they went to Madison Avenue as part of their negotiation for figuring out how much they should be getting for their ad spend, right? So one of the big areas that, at least from our, uh, from an Uyala perspective, that we are really focused on is, how do we sort of bring this ecosystem of content, audience, and advertising together from a data perspective, uh, from a technology perspective, so that we can sort of even the playing field. So regardless of whether you're a publisher looking to sell your ad inventory directly, or whether you're an ad agency like WPP looking to figure out where do I get uh, the 18 to 25 male, and in the TV world, regardless of uh, how much a user watches, uh, 18 to 25 male is identical. But reality is, if I'm uh, if uh, if a male is watching, 90% uh, of the way of a given live stream is a lot more valuable than somebody who switches off 10 minutes into viewing, right? So there are a lot of things that now we can do from a technology perspective which really creates the right incentive uh, for all the people in the ecosystem to participate and then sort of move content over these different devices and platforms. And as I think we always believe, move to a, to a model where it's no longer about cannibalization and saying, are you taking people away from their TV, as they call it? But in our view, you're not really, because that's going to happen regardless. You're actually just increasing the pie because Unfortunately or fortunately, people are just watching more and more TV. And so you just need to take advantage of that and create the right sort of ecosystem to enable that. So speaking of the multiple devices and, it, you know, when tablets first came out and people realized, oh, the, I can have a tablet and I can watch TV, there's an opportunity for a new kind of entertainment experience with a companion device that is synced in some way to the content yep. I'm watching, and there were experiments, uh, Gray's Anatomy uh, and others <laughs> tried that. What, how do you view that as a opportunity, either for improving the consumer experience or for uh, uh, you know, content providers and others to uh, either generate more eyeballs or, or more uh, subscription revenue or whatever? Um, do you view these devices as companions, as alternate viewing screens, as complementary where you know if i'm watching on a tablet it might stimulate tv viewing uh, how how do all of you view the multiple device uh, devices today well i've seen um broadcasters effectively use digital in, in both capacities so um mtv does the you know the mtv uh, vmas i've seen them deploy a live webcam of the build of the black carpet, which, you know, is basically installing a, a live stream basic camera. And they'll have, you know, 12,000 simultaneous people watching guys, you know, put the, the, the carpet down, essentially. And that's an audience that they drive into the broadcast. Uh, conversely, the Grammys and CBS have done a whole week of build up into the broadcast. So they'll live stream panels about the music industry parties and also show a lot of VOD content that the Recording Academy has, uh, has uh, acquired. So you'll see uh, uh, Marvin Gaye's 1970 uh, Grammy acceptance speech. A lot of what they've done in that build up in social media is attributed to, they, they pointed to a 33% increase in the, in the broadcast ratings. Now, a lot of that had to do with the fact that they changed their format to you know, 12 amazing performances by the biggest artists in the world during the broadcast. But those networks and those brands capitalize on that kind of pre-advanced digital strategy that led into the broadcast. Same, you know, with the Oscars, you, we've done shows for them. The, the pre-show for the Oscars is six different video feeds before the the actual telecast. So you have the red carpet arrival, the fashion cam, uh, the hosted cam. And then you can actually see some of the th the winners going through the winners walk live streamed as the broadcast is going on getting their statuette engraved, and then they go into the governor's ball. Real effective ways to capitalize on 
an audience that may not tune into the broadcast or, or really now you've got them completely engaged watching, you know, from start to finish from the digital stream into the actual broadcast. The other uh, sort of nuance here, we, from our perspective, since we have a pretty wide variety of customers on our platform, um, I think a few years ago, the tablet was really considered as a companion, as you said, because you sort of, the uh, publishers and broadcasters really assumed that the TV was the primary mode of consumption. So it's how do you augment that experience rather than replace. Uh, what we are increasingly finding is that uh, a lot of the broadcasters are looking as tablet as a primary uh, mode of consumption because uh, especially for live events and otherwise, you got to watch it if you're in a subway or you're at work. Uh, and so uh, the TV, it, it's, it's, it's an even playing field from a device perspective. So uh, when you have that mindset, uh, you want to provide an uncluttered experience to the consumer just as you would on television. And that's a lot of what we are seeing as well is it has to be exactly as as the person would watch. Same kind of ad experience, same kind of uh, quality, all of that. Uh, you do have the opportunity to sort of augment that through live feeds or scores or stats and things like that. Uh, but I think that's a, a mind shift that has also happened uh, but it's a little bit different than a few years ago. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, yeah, yeah, some of the second screen apps that I noticed was seemed to be getting a lot of traction were, especially in Europe, like uh, was in uh, racing, Formula One racing, getting all the stats and information of the cars and stuff that are going on during the race. Uh, There's also a company that we ran into in Latin America that had, it was interesting, it was like a soap opera, and your second screen actually during the show, you can be asking questions to the actors on the stage or the, their character, and someone was responding with, so you're actually asking them in character type of questions, <laughs> and um, they were responding through text. So it was kind of trying to drive a uh, uh, simultaneous question, you know, interaction with the actors, and they were seeing some pretty strong responses from that. But I, I think really the biggest second screen use is discovery. People are using, they're finding it easier to find content with the interfaces on their tablets or their phone, and then with you know Chromecast and other types of devices, they can flick it to their TV, and it, it yep. just makes an easier way of discovering. Because I'll tell you, the set-top box discovery is painful. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, second screen, I think, at first kind of hit as potentially the next big thing, maybe, I want to say, like, three years ago. Yeah. And I, mean, I think we've been, I mean, we've been waiting. We know, like, whatever it is, 80-some percent of people use a mobile or a tablet while they're watching TV. It's just that uh, they're not, they kind of are, they're doing other things. They're exactly. tweeting and they're mm -hmm. checking their Facebook mm -hmm. uh, updates and all that kind of stuff. And um, do they want something that's so synchronized? I don't know. The jury's still out. It could still happen. I don't think over three years we, we know yet, um, but it hasn't like taken us by storm. So I think we're waiting. I think it's interesting, like on the Chromecast thing, that uh, the concept of, it as a remote yep. may, may move forward. Uh, and that does tell you who's watching, which is something that, um, mm -hmm. you know, is being solved other ways. Like, you know, now I know on my Xbox, you know, anyone who's watching Netflix, you know, in my family is saying, well, they want to go, they want to log in as who, who they are. So mm -hmm. they get, they can watch what they were just watching and know what's on their list and all that kind of stuff. So Netflix kind of solved it a different way yeah. uh, as far as knowing who's watching, which, Ironically, is more important for an ad-supported network uh, than a subscription network. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to see different different uh, ways to approach it. <clears throat> well, Dave, you mentioned uh, set-top box discovery. Traditional set-top box discovery is um, <clears throat> lacking in uh, user experience. So, what are and, and let's talk about service providers. Traditional uh, pay TV providers. Um, over-the-top video or video delivered over the public internet is clearly a threat to them, but it's also potentially an opportunity. And I was wondering if you could uh, give your perspectives on, you know, how is it a threat? How is it an opportunity for traditional pay TV operators? I start with the operator in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Although you're not really yourself, the operator. Well, we're in the back end for, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, for Fios. Uh, and and that kind of thing as well. So you want to, so just to, to make sure I understand, you want to hear. How is it a threat and how is it an opportunity yeah. over the time? Well, I mean, I think any, any uh, last mile uh, connection uh, globally, whether, um, you know, whether you're a fixed access or mobile access, you know, you're collecting, um, you know, 
uh, uh, revenue from a consumer uh, for you know either two or three things. You're you know you're either saying I'm going to provide you uh, you know I'm your internet service provider. I'm going to also offer you a video service and then less and less uh, you know a, a telephone service uh, as well. But that that kind of triple click play concept is central to most uh, of the service providers. And I think that some service providers have taken the philosophy that uh, we're just gonna focus, we're agnostic. Uh, if we, we don't really long-term need to be the video service provider, we're gonna be focusing on you know, delivering the bits to the eyeballs. Uh, others uh, you know, who have a dominant share, I think uh, <laughs> uh, are much uh, you know, more interested in protecting that spot as being the aggregator of video content and I think have taken a more aggressive role uh, in terms of defending that turf against uh, over the top uh, you know, competition. Um, I think what's interesting you know, as you look over the long-term though is that uh, at the end of the day, you say over the top, the definition of it is delivered over the open internet, which is not really true. Um, if you think about how, if you've been following all the Netflix uh, news, I mean, what happens is, you know, if Netflix wants to deliver to a tier two service provider, they say, hey, we're gonna put this open connect streamer inside your network. And, you know, it might be at the head end level, it might even go down to the hub level, and there might be a bunch of them. And when it's, so deep inside a service provider network, all of a sudden their performance goes through the roof and they're delivering 4K, um, you know, with, uh, you know, with a high degree of quality. And it's almost mimicking the way that, you know, mm -hmm. the rest of the video is being provided uh, within that provider's network. Uh, if you think about the way it's provided to the tier ones, it, it um, you know, it's at that kind of you know, at the last connection point to get inside that network, but it's being delivered within the service providers network uh, to to the eyeballs. The problem is it's not being cached deep inside the network, um, uh, and and that that issue is is I think um, over time will limit what Netflix can do inside the tier ones. Uh, you know, from a performance standpoint, from a 4K, and you kind of talk about buffering all those other technology issues. But again, it goes back to the business uh, for me the business underline of well you, you need to have that business relationship solved on some level to get to that that performance level of having your caches deep inside a, a network so that um, you can develop for, de deliver the same I think quality and scalability that you have with that that qualm infrastructure that supports the set-top box so did I answer your question? I just swirl around and then I yeah, forget. Yeah, I, I mean, it's certainly uh, some, I'm not sure it, <laughs> yeah, it would I give mean, a well, comprehensive answer to the yeah. question, but no, it was, uh, <laughs> that was, so to, that yeah, was to, great. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's, 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 it's both. You have to, I guess the short answer is, you know, if you're collecting revenue from a customer to be a s internet service provider and a video service provider, you have to balance your response because you, you can't just say, uh, you know, we're, we we want to be the highest performing for your Netflix and your Hulu and your over the top because you're paying us money mm -hmm. to be an internet service provider. Uh, so you, you have to, and I think you've seen that with Comcast and with Verizon. Verizon, we were back to number one in terms of Netflix uh, mm -hmm. after all this. So no one's trying, I think it's for all, everything that's been written about, um, everyone wants to give the consumer the best experience they can get. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's just that there's different businesses um, in it, and it'll be interesting how it plays out. Well, as the the other person on the panel, who's I mean, we all are yes. now owned by a telco, <laughs> <That's true. laughs> uh, which is uh, the dominant telco down in Australia. Uh, to your question, I think a lot of the operators are looking at this as an opportunity, especially in markets where it's pre Netflix, right? So they sort of see the writing on the wall that. If we don't get our act together and really leverage the asset that we have, which is the subscriber billing relationship, we do have a relationship with the subscriber, with the household, and our entire business is predicated around aggregating content and providing that experience. How do we sort of evolve that experience uh, to provide that to consumers? Because otherwise, uh, we're going to be irrelevant. Uh, and so based on every conversation that we have had, uh, it's been pretty, um, uh, I mean, all of them looking at, look at this as an opportunity uh, to get their house in order to figure out um, how do we actually deliver the best experience. Otherwise, Netflix or somebody else would, uh, would come and, uh, uh, you know, eat their share. 
Well, yeah. I think the uh, cannibalism is a is a difficult concept for a millennial to grasp. And you know, history dictates that when NBC put the office on the internet, their ratings went up. You know, the Daily Show was really discovered online and drew people to the actual broadcast. I, I've spent a lot of time in, in content security and anti piracy. When you hold back content from authorized channels, you know, people get pissed off, and then they're going to start to, to pirate it. Um, and, but I also, you know, looking at the overall market, I look at the, you know, the music festival in and of itself has become a cultural phenomenon. You know, these experiences are selling out before the promoters announce who the bands are. They've gone to multiple, you know, two weekends back to back and are still selling out. And, you know, people knock the music industry as having fallen, you know, the victims of, of piracy, but they've woken up and they've, they've redirected and now they're being very strategic and successful with partners like Beats and, and Spotify. And if you look at, you know, Coachella this year was live streamed on YouTube weekend one and lived on Access TV uh, on weekend two. So it solved both issues. But I, I, it didn't cannibalize audiences either way. And in fact, I would argue that a lot of people that watch the YouTube webcast tuned in to see cast on, on Access TV that following weekend. Yeah, and I uh, read a study that um, I think it's definitely going to enhance I think it's definitely going to enhance. You have to bit of, have a bit of confidence in your content, but I think it's definitely going to enhance things for the for the networks. I read a study that said that um, even though millennials are watching most of their content time shifted, um, they're still watching a lot of premium TV. They're still watching a lot of prime time TV. In fact, the study I read from you, you, uh, Yahoo said that that was the that was what they watched most. So. People are still watching them. The question is then, if it's time shifted, how do you how do advertisers address those eyeballs? Now, that's a question. But um, you know, and the other thing is that you know, eMarketer in April said that um, that uh, they were predicting that the ad revenues from U YouTube were going to stay uh, quite constant, but actually the ad revenues from the premium content um, uh, premium content platforms like uh, Yahoo Screen and AOL on were actually going to go up because the the advertisers want to be where the more premium content is and because YouTube is a lot of UGC um, they felt like the advertisers were moving to where the premium content is so I think all of this comes together to say um, it's only going to enhance uh, the world for content providers for and when you say it's only going to enhance the multiple screens, the multiple uh, screens, yeah. the, okay. the, the the ability to to get things where mm -hmm. you want. Mm -hmm. And so, in terms of traditional uh, service providers, uh, pay TV operators, um, you know, we do this annual consumer video survey, mm -hmm. and one of the questions we ask is, you know, if you could have a single app from your cable TV provider uh, versus multiple apps, one for each of my favorite mm -hmm. channels, you know, which sounds better to you? And um, overwhelmingly, people say a single app from my cable TV provider. And uh, in fact, younger consumers are more likely to say, you know, multiple apps. But even there, it's like more than two thirds want that single app. You know, is is there still a you know, when I interpret this, I look at this and I say it's pay TV operators game to lose here, you know, and uh, I'm just curious about your thoughts. Do you see enough flexibility in traditional pay TV operators and the ecosystem to be able to absorb uh, video uh, and distribute it across multiple platforms? Or, or, or do you see them, uh, in other words, embracing OTT video? So, so I, I mean, I think this goes back to the point that I was making around uh, really creating an even playing field for uh, broadcasters, operators, and the consumers. So the scenario that you mentioned is obviously excellent for the consumer because you want a single place where you can go and find the content. If you talk to every single broadcaster out there, each of them is looking to create a unique experience mm -hmm. around the way folks find their content because a lot of their brand, in addition to the content, is also about the experience, right? So ESPN wants to create a very different experience around their content, around how they engage with the consumers than Univision or some, uh, or a news portal, right? Uh, so a lot of these sort of multi-platform experiences and discovery experiences that broadcasters are looking to create in some ways works contradictory to the whole, uh, I want to just get one Google search kind of box that enables us to search content across all of these experiences. So I think this is part of the challenge here is how do you sort of 
uh, create a, uh, a, the right platform for the broadcasters because the more unique the experience is, the higher premiums that they're going to get uh, because the more engaged the audience is going to be. Uh, on the other hand, you want to simplify the universe for uh, the consumer. And this is why I think uh, personally that the, the operators are actually very well positioned to sort of, as long as you create the right platform to, to create the right kind of user experience around discovery and personalizing the content, uh, because they already have access uh, to the content from the from the broadcasters and the relationship with the consumer. Uh, so that you know is probably going to be sort of the happy medium uh, where where this shakes out. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be going completely one extreme or the other. I just want to I, I have to say that you know. The, when we first heard the word TV everywhere, whenever it was yeah. coined, uh, you know, I think most people presumed the MVPDs would run with it and it would be one app <laughs> with uh, the MVPD. But again, I, I think it comes, comes down to the rights question. Yep. And that the reason the broadcasters or the networks um, have dominated TV everywhere over the last few years is they have the rights. It's their rights and they can go direct to consumer. They can put that iOS, uh, you know, Android app out there and people can download and go direct it. to the advertiser. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, you know, no, other than um, those with the largest uh, subscriber base have difficulty in securing those rights and kind of say, well, we're going to wait till the next contract cycle, yep. then we're going to uh, handle it. And so it's been a much slower uh, ability from a rights perspective of them to put it on, on one piece of glass for the consumer. Absolutely. But it, again, it's I think it is it's hitting uh, it, it, those contract cycles are finally coming to a close and the new ones you're starting to see more of that and I think it's going to change uh, but uh, it's been slow to start. I, I, I agree I think the, the right side of it has shaped how it's evolved and I think from looking at you know the, the optimal solution for a consumer it would be having a single solution but to all the points you know HBO Go they want their experience you know ESPN wants their experience and, and quite honestly I think what we'll find is the consumer is better off with them having separate channels and then you go into the mode of well maybe they all have their little channel within one bigger bigger app but whoever makes the bigger app is going to want control over what sits in those channels maybe controlling when those features get updated uh, controlling you know, how much content is going to be there there's a lot of things that they don't that to be controlled on their experience. So, and also when that whole app has an issue, is it an HBO issue? I'm watching it and it's failing. So I'm blaming HBO for their service. So I, I yep. think ultimately that we're all better off as consumers if they have their individual app and they can control that user experience and tailor it to what the consumer wants. And it'll actually even drive a common type of a competitive environment where if you want to compete, you need to be at that level of having the right consumer experience. You're no longer captive to that uh, service provider. And you, all, you might also end up with the lowest common denominator problem uh, yeah. because this actually, like you said, creates the incentive for uh, HBO Go to be the first one to do you know, 4K right. uh, content mm -hmm. versus others. So it creates sort of a competitive environment. Yeah, so from a content provider perspective, now obviously, you can't. You have the option of going direct. Uh, let's talk about that. I'm sure other panels have talked about uh, HBO and CBS and their announcements and some question about what will actually happen there. But what what are the? How do you view the opportunities and challenges for content providers? But you know, maybe John also for advertisers uh, to go direct or brands to go direct. Um, and you know what. What are the um, what are the key success factors going to be there? In the uh, in the digital world, I'll give you an example. Working with American Express, uh, they run um, a content experience called Unstaged, where they take an iconic venue somewhere in the country or in the world, they bring in a major major music artist who's about to release a record, and then a famous uh, noteworthy director. So an example of that is John Legend and the Roots performing at Terminal Five in New York with a Spike Lee directing, or Duran Duran at the Miami with David Lynch, and we've done Coldplay at a bullfighting ring in Spain. This is all live streamed on YouTube and on Vivo. And American Express invests very heavily in that business, and their CMO gave a, a keynote at Meetem and acknowledged he reached 22 million people in that, I think, six shows a couple years ago, and had an average view duration time of, of 25 minutes. And you know their belief at Amex is that they're not able to replicate that type of reach and engagement in any form of advertising that they're doing. 
And, and from a digital perspective, we see that in, in, in streaming is similar to television. A lot of what's, what's happening in live, you get longer consumption, uh, longer engagement, and a larger audience, especially when you bring in the ability that the consumer can switch the camera feed. And I can watch what's happening on stage one at Coachella or stage two, or I can look at Spike Lee's feed online and switch to you know the, the, a different view inside the, the venue. But they can also talk and communicate and collaborate, which is not, they're not allowed, they, they believe, to do that in television. They can't live tweet and post and comment participate in a, in a widget that's uh, a trivia widget or, an, or a polling gadget that lives inside of an ad unit. So for the advertiser like an Amex or T-Mobile delivering Coachella this year, uh, on the festival side, they get a 60 plus minute viewer duration time uh, in some of these cases for a, for a music festival. Pretty significant uh, opportunities for them um, in that perspective on, uh, on a digital platform. Hmm. Um, and then if you're a content provider, <clears throat> um, what are some of the things you have to worry about uh, if you are uh, trying to establish a new over-the-top service? You know, what what are the what issues is CBS going to run into? Uh, do you all do you all expect? I think, I mean, my perspective is in, in a funny way. They don't have a rights problem; they have a technology problem, <laughs> um, and that's that uh, they the the you know the. The, the, the service provider owns the last mile to the consumer and the content provider doesn't. And so the way that like Netflix has solved that has been, you know, with Open Connect and with, um, you know, trying to get as deep inside the service provider's network as they can. And lack um, of live. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so, the, yeah, I think there's some challenges uh, in if you if, you know, we're at the very beginning of, you know, the hockey stick that we presume is going to be a hockey stick uh and um you know what happens at scale uh is still a question mark um and how you can support like 4k at scale um is still an open question from a technology perspective certainly given the current architecture mm -hmm. of uh you know someone coming over the top i don't i don't know how that scales frankly um i think it needs a different architecture so i think that that's the challenge of uh you know, a content owner is, you know, how, how do you um, have a scale of, you know, s something with the same quality and scalability of what people are used to um, with an over the top type offering. The, the other point here, which we often forget is also sort of organizational challenges between, you know, in some of these larger uh, companies who have done business a certain way for, for, you know, you know, in some cases, uh, hundreds of years, right? Depending on the, the company. So, uh, uh, you know, as you look at the new model, uh, you know, you have, you know, in, you know, a, two different sort of content workflow organizations. You have two different ad sales organizations. So it's, it's less about uh, merging technology platforms. I mean, that's obviously a big part of it and delivering the kind of experience, but it's also uh, merging the organization. So they think of this as, a single experience, whether it's a iPad or a TV, as opposed to two different organizations with two different mission statements and two different set of incentives. Uh, some organizations have gotten uh, much better at, better at this than others, but I think that's one uh, aspect that we tend to gloss over as well, uh, because that's a big part of making it successful. Yeah, I think the challenge definitely is, as you say, it's it's building these platforms and then maintaining and running them with the right staff. And yep. you can point to some. <clears throat> runaway successes you know major league baseball advanced media super successful in that business uh ufc before they got all that television coverage did almost everything online which led to some of their broadcast deals they still have a pretty robust um online offering so it, it, again the cost and the ability to run these things is it's pretty substantial the, the good news is there are a lot now uh, of companies that are uh, very adept at building and running these platforms and there's best of breed technology a lot of the, the costs have moved into the cloud it's a lot more economical and feasible to do this today than it was even you know three to five years ago i guess the other challenge is um are we going to have cbs for 5.99 a month abc for whatever uh you know take every channel or are, are, are we really expecting that all of these companies are going to be doing their own customer acquisition and marketing for their individual slices of available content in the world or you know ultimately does it come back to some kind of aggregation and distribution model where i can subscribe to one thing and get 
you know, I was kind of going full circle. <laughs> it, it's, it seems like it could. I mean, yeah. I, it, I guess, you know, a lot of it depends on the success and how much investment CBS makes in customer acquisition. Well, and it's also when the consumer soon realizes that if they're actually watching 10 different channels, they will end right. up with the same subscription amount, mm -hmm. uh, which is often glossed over when people talk about a la carte. Mm -hmm. There are very few people that actually will stick to just one channel. And the moment you add, I want to watch news from here, I do desperately need to watch those live sporting events. And I really like this cooking show mm -hmm. on this. And soon you will end up with a 50, 60, 70 dollar uh, bill. And then you might as well deal with a single bill, a single provider, a single experience. So uh, I, I personally think the whole a la carte thing is is great marketing speak, but doesn't really benefit the consumer. Especially when you're a household with uh, more than one yeah. person, you have a variety of different needs and your kids are going to watch different content than you and your wife may have other shows. So finally you get into like eight subscriptions and um, it, it does, it adds up and you're back to your, you know, your cable bill. And then you may not have quite the, the experience that you know, maybe your quality of service was more consistent with the cable bill. <laughs> Yeah, I would just say that maybe the competition comes from outside uh, in the sense of, you know, uh, outside the kind of authenticated channels that live inside. You know, I mean, the I, I believe my children would be perfectly happy with YouTube. Uh, that's already got 90 percent of their viewing hours. But then you uh, get to the rights question. Again. Right. But I mean, I'm just saying that that's you, I think that you, the content's being created by you know, Amazon now by, yeah. um, you know, obviously by YouTube uh, for a while now. And, and I think the question is just if that's, you know, they're all making their bets, you know, uh, YouTube on an ad supported model um, that will never, you know, I mean, they experimented with some subscriptions, but it still seems to be principally around um, ad support yep. uh, and just access. And um, I think that's the way that you get down to just, well, I want to, I want to pay for my ISP and maybe not, you know, a couple other channels, but that's how it gets down mm -hmm. to it. And again, there's other uses of leisure time other than yeah. sitting in front of the TV and games and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think it's still an open question if that millennial and the, the next generation after wants to pay, I don't know what, what they do want to pay. But that's still an I, open I, question. Yeah, I think it all favors Netflix, who's our largest service provider in the US. <laughs> um, essentially, if you can uh, live with not having those premium windows and wait for your content, then all you need is the a la carte sports and you're in business. So I think the a la carte would help Netflix because people are going to start looking at all the different pieces and realizing that they can wait and view once it's in that window and they can fill with just the sports Netflix volume will grow. I, I don't think people are going to start paying. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I look at it like, I think what Netflix spent three billion on rights this past year, um, and what does that buy? It buys yeah, you know, highest of games and uh, orange or whatever, you know. But it doesn't buy you, um, you know, uh, the HBO shows, and it doesn't buy you everything that's on prime time. And it's a really, in terms of total viewer hours, I believe, you know, Netflix it's six hours a day per person, and I think they're at like. 25 minutes per person if you take it mm -hmm. across that. So they're still, for $3 billion, they're getting, you know, 10% of the viewer hours. Uh, so it's going to be a lot more money. Either they're going to keep growing and they're going to spend $30 billion <laughs> on content. But that's what, it, to me, it takes $30 billion on content to get right. a and bigger it, slice of the viewer hours. At, at the yeah. end of the day, the content providers have the knobs they can turn on Netflix. <laughs> right. Well, they just spend a lot more on content. Yeah. Well, you know, interestingly, um, to your point, Peter, the uh, we do this annual consumer the brand value of Netflix versus my cable TV operator and the survey, and we did this trade off, this conjoint analysis. Um, Netflix actually slipped in the 18 to 24 year olds uh, this year relative to last year after kind of steadily growing. And one of the, this is a qualitative thing, but I've heard a fair number of millennials say, I feel like I've watched everything there is on Netflix. So gigantic library, but the new content has to be constantly refreshed and it's really expensive. So uh, you know, I think I think you make a good point. And, and live TV, we're also seeing 
um, a lot of interest in millennials on seeing shows when they first come out. So it isn't all about on-demand viewing. There's still some, for very popular shows, still some magic around when a show first airs and then making sure that you're keeping up with your friends and not getting, you know, the surprise is spoiled uh, by your friends. You know, I, I hate to base too much of my market understanding on my kids, but it's pretty <laughs> scary. Like when you think of like, you talk about like Netflix is spending $3 billion on rights and they get 25 minutes, uh, whatever. but I mean, if you look at what my, my kids graduated from watching people play Minecraft, you know, for hours a day to now, <laughs> like inexplicably, that's no longer cool. And they've moved on to a bunch of other shows, but all through YouTube's recommendation engine, uh, you know, of basically they'll click on this and they've moved out of that into other things that YouTube thought they'd enjoy. And they're watching those now, uh, Dude Perfect and a bunch of other YouTube shows. But, uh, you know, none of this has anything to do with uh, the traditional, you know, mm -hmm. way that content is created and licensed and so forth. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's going to be interesting. Let's see uh, if anyone has questions in the audience. Uh, here's one. Yes. The question is slash comment. Uh, you guys were talking about Apple Stock. Everyone loves a big premiere, six figure all the channel. But we know that typically the world is 70% more class. You can offer them something that they didn't have the facilities for, right? At a price that they can. Or I think the numbers for these carriers will increase. And, and as money comes and goes, right? So if your money is high for six months, if you're a seasonal employee, then you can grab several pieces of this a la carte pie. And then as your money dwindles, you can knock off a few and you can ride the low rates to have what you want. So I see nothing but additional dollars coming in from this whole thing. So I, th I guess the question there is, <clears throat> do you think that um, service providers are appropriately segmenting their customer base to understand uh, what the targeted offers might be to different segments, whether it's to millennials or, or uh, other uh, lower income parts of the population? You know, what are your thoughts there? I think the point that was being made by, I think, a couple of folks on the panel was, um, I, I think the a la carte pricing is going to coexist with the subscription model or the bundle model that exists today. Um, I don't think, I, I think you'll see a lot of press though that it's going to be all a la carte and the bundles are going to disappear. And I think that's what we were refuting that that's yeah. probably overblown, mm -hmm. makes for good press release, but it's probably exaggerated. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other uh, questions from, yes. So I can go. Because, <laughs> no, he's going to say. So we, uh, all of our customers actually want, and all the broadcasters actually want a blend, because uh, there is there is a lot of value in human curated content and promoting content that you produce. Uh, in fact, uh, our customers would also come and say, uh, if you're showing me or showing our consumers a carousal of let's say ten recommended videos we want number two and three spots to be the content that we produce and promote um, or you know something along those lines and the main reason for that is uh, you know most of the existing um, recommendation systems are essentially collaborative filtering based uh, so some of these also tend to be self-fulfilling um, and so you know as you get more views as you get uh, a sort of a a graph built around content consumption, that's the one that will continue to show up uh, in recommendation systems. But you want to sort of break that. You want to promote new shows that people have never heard about um, and also promote your brand as a result. And so uh, every single one of our uh, customers who look at analytics, who look at creating that personalized experience, want to have control over that end user experience by creating a blend of curated as well as uh, uh, algorithmically uh, produced uh, lists. Oh, like, 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 uh, more analytical. 
Um, yeah. on the size. No, I think it depends. Yeah, it depends on the size of the the customer. I mean, not all customers really have a large editorial team um, to deal with it, but uh, the ones that do certainly want to have more control um, over that experience. Yeah, and I, and I actually thought your question was more around, um, you know, what can we learn by crunching big data, perhaps on some new series that if we had this guy write it and this actress and it was a crime drama set in um, L.A. or whatever, that that would be much more popular than something else. But was that were you going there as well or or not? No. I think, yeah, I think <laughs> okay. Got it. Um, Imagine you, you can get feedback too. If you're doing more analytical, uh, you can start to see feedback. Are people actually watching my recommendations, right? Yep. And uh, you can always run studies. A lot of times they'll part out the segment and some people will have more editorials in one group than another group to see what the net effect is, right? Yes, Jason. I think one of the reasons why uh, it's more that idea that it might be more attractive to consumers uh, that you know we're going to get uh, CBS and Netflix and they cobble things together and continue to build their own their own OTT uh, OTT collection and they're going to pay more possibly than they would be paying on MPTV if that emotional gets rid of the resentment that I as a consumer putting myself right. in the <laughs> That's why I think it's a it's a in the gentleman Pierce question plays into the same thing. It's that I think the consumer is ultimately happy when he has all the options, and so if you give him the options to break it down to a la carte, but if you show him package deals where he says, "Wow, I'm going to buy these four a la carte now, I'm going to get all this extra stuff for about the same price, or maybe a dollar more," you know, he's going to feel more empowered to make a decision. And right now, the problem with service providers is you feel like you don't have the option. I've seen some focus groups with, you know, whatever, millennials uh, that uh, say that uh, they're not, it's not, they're not price conscious at all. It kind of goes to what you say. It's, and and we already have an a la carte offering out there in, in iTunes. And they would say, yeah, I'm going to pay more just to get season passes to the three shows that I want, because it's, then I can watch it at, you know, there's no, it's cached on my device, so it always works. It always looks awesome. I take it with me wherever I go. I can watch it on any screen. Um, it works for me. It's, uh, I can watch it by myself when I'm by myself. I can watch it with my friends. So it's worth the extra money for the whatever number of shows I'm really going to watch. I'll just get, I'll just own them. I'll buy them. Uh, no ads, that kind of thing. So I think that uh, there's already, you know, we haven't seen the, you know, the numbers yet to say that, uh, but in focus groups, I've seen that as basically saying that's that's I don't care if it costs more. It's what I want. So I'll pay for it. But we've actually seen um, when we've done conjoint analysis with download as an option in addition to streaming, it does. There is like, you know, probably a couple of dollars incremental per month that you could get if you had a download as a mm -hmm. as a feature. So, um, yeah, having that as an option, it's mm -hmm. it it does solve a lot of the problems from the consumer experience perspective with advertising, you know, better, much better quality when I'm watching it, et cetera. Yes. Uh, any other next generation technologies coming up the pipe that we should be at least thinking of? I know Vantage TV did its uh, live uh, virtual reality broadcast at ACL Live this past weekend. I think it's C-Space is doing an augmented reality and layering in front of Anything else next, Jen, we should be mentioning? And uh, I think by virtual... the way, this is a great uh, final question, I think. Be it, so feel free to uh, add your ideas on where you see things um, going. Uh, for sure, virtual reality, I, I think, is going to be a, a big potential uh, moneymaker or uh, enhancement to an experience. You know, by virtue of my business now, I've, I've started to spend more time in the uh, electronic music business. 
and it's a, almost a vastly different culture. Everybody wants to participate in that experience, including the artists. You know, we'll, we'll do a big festival, and Eminem may not want to be in the webcast. That's not the case with all of the, the EDM artists, their agents, um, all of the stakeholders, and the, the uh, attendees. And it does, I think, prove that millennials do want to pay. They'll pay a premium to go to these festivals and their destinations. And they're also involved in fashion and lifestyle brands, et cetera. And that uh, Vantage TV uh, offering at ACL is, I think, an indication of that. So now you can extend that experience into the, tele into the, into the home. And an electronic show, I'm learning, starts at like 6 at night and goes to 6 in the morning. And there'll be viewing parties on an Apple TV or some sort of device in someone's home. And the background is the, is the festival music playing while they're having a party. And you can also bring in that virtual experience as well, where you, know, you can walk around the stage and see Tiesto performing. And the difference there, too, is what's happening in the arena. So when we do an Arcade Fire, you know, Arcade Fire is nine musicians who actually switch instruments on the stage. It's about what happens on the stage at an electronic show. If it's you know Paul Oakenfold or Dead Mouse, it's what's happening in the entire uh, arena. What the lighting is like, what the fashion is like. Uh, we, you know, uh, the entire performance is really the artist and how they interact with the audience. I mean, if you're asking, you know, to look forward five years and see what what uh, what I think is going to be. Um, first of all, I think, uh, you know, using the type of metadata and the deep audience insights that we can gather today, what I think is going to, you know, I imagine this, my one big TV in my bed, in my living room, which is a personalized experience for me. So I sit down and my TV knows it's me and I'm getting programmatically bought ads for me and I'm seeing the latest Jimmy Fallon clips that I wanted to see and the latest stuff from Netflix and HBO and all of that. And it's all there and it's all for me. And in the end, I'm still watching reruns of Friends. <laughs> That's what I see in five years. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, any, uh, what, else, what else is going to happen in the next five years? Technology, business model disruption, you know, rights being unleashed, uh, you know, what, what, what else is going to happen, panel? <clears throat> smell a vision <laughs> Well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to say one other yeah. thing, actually. And I think, I think it's, it's kind of going to, it's on the side, right? And I really think that advertising is going to become more, um, a conversation with the audience as opposed to talking at the audience. And I think we're going to see a much closer connection between, you know, when we're talking about in, in our business in kind of short form online distribution, um, where the content and the ads are actually going to live in harmony together, where there'll be a situation where we can actually create branded moments where the ad and the content kind of work together to extend that moment, to extend the emotional relationship that the brands spend so much time working on to build with their, uh, with their um, users or potential users. And so I think that there's going to be a real development in advertising and how it relates to content and how content um, is that package is consumed. But, and I think that, you know, one of the things that I often say is don't underestimate the consumer. You know, the only, the only time you ever make a mistake is when you think people are dumb, right? So respect, respecting the consumer, respecting them in terms of giving them really good ads if it's native, if it's combined with pieces of content which happen to be related, that kind of thing, I think, is how we move forward in the in the ad content scenario. I, I think one of the things you'll see is I think that the cost of the platform to build out a, an OTT service gets more and more reasonable, and uh, and also operating the service that you're going to see a lot of these specialty, very specialized, you know, a la carte services over the top that might be religious based, that might be any affiliation that they're going to find and be able to target audiences throughout throughout the globe. And you know, one of the things that's interesting is we, we, we operate with services like uh, Samsung's Media Hub and Video Hub, those types of services where the challenge is translating it and subtitles. And, and then you think about you know, services where there might be a Rotana in the Middle East that wants their, their content available to consider, consider it expats who want to see that content, right? Uh, the challenge, it's a lot easier. You don't have to deal with translating it because everyone that from that region that's gone elsewhere wants to see access to that content now it's a really simple problem to solve and and you see it from i think it was direct tv that has a rotana channel now that has it's a 
let's say 40 bucks a month and you get a variety of channels and um, it, it's incredibly profitable. And I think you're going to see, you see an investment from the satellite providers doing more and more of those. I think you'll see that grow. I think you'll see um, also channels popping up that are people uh, looking at YouTube and other types of, um, you know, self-creation sites and being able to curate, find the talent on those, curate them, and then start offering those channels as premium channels and giving those artists the ability to get their own footprint on all these devices. I think you'll see a lot more of that because I think that's where there's opportunity to make money. All right. Well, we have hit our time limit. Uh, please join me in thanking our uh, panelists.